Well, thank you for that introduction. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, as Jennifer said, I'm here as a researcher, but I've also been at Bing as a parent, and so I'm doubly thrilled to be here. So I thought what I would do is just start with a question. Um, how many of you think that most people want to feel the same way? Raise your hands. If you think most people want to feel the same way. Raise your hands. OK, some of you guys. OK. How many of you think that most people want to feel differently? Raise your hands. OK, so about equal numbers of people. When I first started doing this research on culture and emotion, most scholars thought that culture influenced our emotional responses. And that suggested that we would see lots of cultural differences in how people actually feel. But when we actually brought people of different cultures into the lab and had them engage in a number of different emotional tasks, like watch sad and amusing film clips or relive different episodes in their lives when they felt happy or angry, and then we measured all these different aspects of their emotional responses, how fast their hearts were beating, we asked them how they felt, we recorded the, min the minute facial muscle movements on their faces. We were really surprised that we found more similarities than differences across cultures. And this led, this was a puzzle. You know, how could we find, how could it be that so many people talked about cultural differences in emotion, and how could it be that we found more similarities than differences? And in fact, in other labs, um, psychological labs, they also found more cultural similarities than differences in emotion. And, but it led to the realization that what we did and what other studies had done was combine measures of actual and ideal affect. And when we started separating how people actually felt from how they ideally wanted to feel, this is where we started finding some striking cultural differences. So for example, in one study, we asked European Americans and Hong Kong Chinese, what is your ideal state? And so a typical response that we got from a European American college participant was, I just want to be happy. Normally for me, that means I want to be doing something exciting. I just want to be entertained. I just like excitement. And this is in contrast to a typical response that we received from a Hong Kong Chinese college student. My ideal state is to be quiet, serene, happy, and positive. So what you'll notice is that both participants are talking about being happy, but the specific states they're associating with happiness varies. In fact, when we asked all the participants in a number of different studies to rate how much they ideally wanted to feel a number of different emotional states, we again found that European Americans, shown here in red, wanted to feel excited states, excited, enthusiastic, energetic, elated, much more than their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts, shown here in light blue. And that our Hong Kong Chinese participants wanted to feel calm states, calm, peaceful, relaxed much more than their European American counterparts. Now you'll see in green are the Chinese Americans who are oriented to both American and Chinese cultures. They are like their European American counterparts in that they want to feel these excited states more than Hong Kong Chinese, but they're also like their Hong Kong Chinese peers in that they want to feel the calm states more than their European American peers. Now, in, um, we've replicated these differences in lots of different studies. Um, but what's important to know is that in all of these studies, we also asked participants, how much do you actually feel these states? And um, in contrast to the clear differences that we see in ideal affect, we almost find no cultural differences in how people actually feel these states. And even when we find those differences, they're really small compared to the cultural differences in ideal affect. OK, so this has really led us to argue and, and conclude that culture influences how we want to feel our ideal affective states even more than how we actually feel or our actual affect. Now, how do we begin to learn how to want to feel? Um, where do we learn how, um, what our culture values? Well, we turn to the media, right? We looked at um, the emotional content of popular media in the United States and China, such as women's magazines. And we found that women's magazine contained much more broad, toothy, what we call Julia Roberts smiles, um, compared to uh, Chinese women's magazines, which contained more calm smiles, more Buddha-like smiles. Um, we also looked at social media, and we found that the Facebook profiles of European American college students contained much more excited expressions and um, contained photos of them engaging in these stimulating activities compared to their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts. 
Um, we've even recently looked at the official website photos of American leaders and Chinese leaders, and again found these differences. Whether it's in government, in business, or academia, American leaders show much more excited smiles. So the idea then here is that it's through um, exposure to these kinds of images that we begin to learn to want to feel a certain way. Now, why do these cultural differences in ideal affect matter? Well, in another series of studies, we've shown that how people want to feel influences their everyday choices, their everyday behaviors. So we found that the more people value excitement states, the more likely they are to engage in physically rigorous activity like running versus walking. The more likely they are to choose consumer products that are stimulating versus soothing like teas. Um, we've um, recently been really interested in how ideal affect influences our social choices, who we choose to be with and spend time with. So in one study, we've shown European Americans and Hong Kong Chinese two faces, an excited or a calm face, and we've asked them to choose the face that they want to see again. And we find that European Americans, shown here in red, are more likely to choose the excited over the calm face compared to their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts. And it doesn't matter if the face is white or Asian or male or female, European Americans prefer these excited um, faces. So, um, there are these cultural differences in ideal affect. They shape what we do in our daily lives, our daily choices. But when does this all begin? Now, on the one hand, you might think that human culture is so complex, and it probably takes a lot of brain development to be able to endorse the values of a culture. And on the other hand, you might think that humans are just wired to fit into their environments in which case they should pick up on the values really quickly, and we should see these cultural differences in ideal affect pretty early on in life. And this is a question that then motivated the research that we started at Bing um, over 10 years ago. Would we find cultural differences in ideal affect in young children? So this is work that I started with Jenny Louie and Eva Chen, and we realized very quickly that we couldn't give our self-report questionnaires <laughs> to these three and five-year-olds. So instead, we showed them two smiley faces, an excited or a calm face, and we asked them to tell us which one they would rather be. We also told them the story about two friends who were having the perfect day. And in this perfect day, they were engaged in a number of activities, um, swimming, playing in the playground. But one of the friends liked to engage in that activity in an excited way. For example, liked to splash a lot when she or he was swimming. And the other friend liked to engage in that same activity in a calmer way, like to float in the swimming pool. And so we asked the kids, who are you more like? The character that likes to engage in the activity in an excited way, or the character who likes to engage in the activity in the calm way? And to give you a feel for what this was like for our participants, I'm going to show you a video. This is of an Asian-American participant. Pool. Yay, do you like the swimming pool? OK, so I'm going to do this. So Abby, she likes to and float in her inner tube, right? But Ashley likes to jump and splash in the swimming pool. Are you more like Abby, who likes to sit and float? Or are you more like Ashley, who likes to jump and splash? I like to float. You like to, like to float. float? And now here's a European-American participant. It's a little hot. They decided to go to the swimming pool. You like the swimming pool? So Abby likes to just sit and float in her inner tube at the swimming pool. But Ashley likes to jump in and splash in the swimming pool. So do you think you're more like Abby who likes to sit and float? Or do you think you're more like Ashley who likes to splash? Ashley. Do you think you're more like Ashley? I like to jump in and dock. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so consistent with our college student data, we found that the European American kids, again in red, were more likely to say they'd rather be the excited smile than the calm smile compared to the Taiwanese Chinese here in light blue. The Asian Americans fell right in the middle. The European Americans were also more likely to say that they were like the character who liked to engage in those activities in an excited way versus a calm way compared to the Taiwanese Chinese. And again, the Asian Americans were in the middle.
Um, so how do kids begin to learn um, to value certain emotional states? Well, again, we looked at the media. We looked at the best-selling storybooks in the United States and Taiwan, and we, con we coded the emotional content of those storybooks. And we found that the American best-selling storybooks had more excited smiles, the characters had more excited smiles, compared to the characters in the best-selling Taiwanese um, storybooks. But we don't think it's just through the media. We think that there are lots of things that we do every day to teach kids how they should want to feel. For those of you who have young kids, um, raise your hand if you've been to Pump It Up or Bouncerama for a birthday party. <laughs> I've been to a number of those recently. And I think there's no better way to teach American kids to value excitement states than to have them jump up and down for an hour yelling and screaming and then to give them pizza and cake afterwards. <laughs> But we've also been interested then um, whether ideal affect, the kids' ideal affect, influences their choices as well as it does for the adults. And so in our most recent study at Bing, um, we had kids, European Americans, Asian Americans, and Japanese, um, look at faces of photos of other kids who are either showing excited, calm, or neutral expressions. These are celebrity kids. We didn't show them celebrity kids' faces. We showed them faces of kids who they didn't know. And we asked them a number of questions about uh, these kids, um, um, including who would you most like to play with? And so the kids just chose um, one of the faces. And what we found was that European Americans on the left were more likely to say they wanted to play with the excited kid than Japanese, who are on the right. The excited kids are in red. The Japanese said they were more likely that they wanted to play with the calm kid um, and they did this, they chose the calm kid more than the European Americans. And this is their choice of the neutral face. So these social choices mimic the differences that we found for our college students. Now, what about Asian Americans? If you remember, they're often right in the middle. But in this case, they were really choosing to play with the calm kids um, more than the excited kids. In fact, none of them chose the excited kids. And I think this is really interesting. I, um, in our work, we're really interested in exploring more how individuals who are exposed to multiple cultures learn to be one culture in one setting and another culture, another, um, be another way in another setting, and really how they might integrate the cultural values of the different uh, cultures that they're exposed to. OK, so um, in conclusion, what we've learned from our work um, at Bing is that culture influences how we want to feel and the choices that we make, and that this occurs relatively early in life. And in our future work, we're interested in looking at kids of other ages to see really how these cultural differences in ideal affect develop over time. We're also interested in what happens when there are mismatches between teachers and students, between counselors and patients, in their ideal affect, what kinds of misunderstandings might emerge from those mismatches, and what we can do to minimize those misunderstandings. So to end, I'd like to again thank Bing for all of its support and to thank you for your attention. Thank you.